The truce between Israel and Hamas has been extended for two more days. The original truce had lasted four days. This comes after intense international pressure on Israel, which carried out a genocidal war on Gaza for 48 days. Now, this war is of course not over. Israeli officials have indicated their intent to continue the assault after the truce. But at least there will be a bit of a breather for the citizens of Gaza who have suffered this horrific assault. We go to Abdul for details about the truce and what is likely to happen in the future. A major global meet on TB was held recently. What were the conclusions? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, a very significant development, the extension of the truce for two more days. So, before we get into some of the details, could you actually tell us what the terms of this extension are and how did it come about? The terms are by and large the same as it was for the previous uh, truce for four days. Uh, Israel will release around 60-odd uh, Palestinian prisoners. In exchange, uh, Hamas is expected to release uh, 20 uh, for two, 10 e on, on each day, uh, Israeli uh, captives uh, from its uh, captivity. Uh, apart from that, the number of uh, aid trucks will continue to uh, be the same, uh, pouring in inside the Gaza Strip from Egyptian border. And so these are the basic uh, conditions which have been the same. Of course, it came about because of the pressure created by the uh, uh, global community and a large number of uh, po popular pressure, basically, which we have seen uh, through the demonstrations all across the world. Uh, forced uh, even the U.S. Uh, to basically exert its uh, pressure on Israel to basically extend it. Uh, so Qatar and Egypt continue to be the mediators and because of their interventions, immediate interventions, this extension has uh, come about. Yeah. Right, Abdul, of course, uh, this is just a bit of a temporary solution, but could you also maybe uh, give us an over uh, outline of how the, the first four days of the truce went, you know, the number of uh, the people released, the humanitarian situation, also uh, the details of the increase, the extent of the attack or the impact of the Israeli offensive on Gaza? Well, uh, for uh, for first four days, as it was agreed initially, the one uh, Isra uh, Israel released around 150 uh, Palestinians from its prison. Most of them were women and children. Uh, uh, in exchange, Hamas released around 50 plus uh, 50 as per the deal, uh, uh, but uh, additional captives, which were basically uh, requested by uh, countries like Iran and other. Uh, countries which have some uh, influence on Hamas in, in some way or other. They also convinced Hamas to release additional prisoners. Uh, so uh, they were also released. Uh, Israel allowed uh, around 200 odd uh, aid uh, trucks to basically go to Gaza. And that basically, to some extent, of course, restored some of the civil uh, civil uh, services, uh, uh, which were uh, which are completely destroyed uh, uh, in last forty eight days uh, in more than forty eight days bombings and ground offensive, particularly in northern Gaza. So uh, uh, some of the uh, hospitals uh, also received some fuel, but a large number of them remained uh, because the number of the amount which is allowed is not a, adequate to kind of fulfill all the needs uh, uh, needs in the Gaza. Uh, as far as the overall destruction is concerned, if you see most of the civil infrastructure uh, 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 inside Gaza is completely destroyed. The Gaza universities in Gaza, the schools, uh, uh, the uh, dispensaries, the uh, bakeries which basically provide food, uh, apart from that, uh, amusement parks like uh, Gaza Zoo and all, most of them have completely gone. So we should remember that Gaza was already uh, uh, under blockade for more than uh, 16 years, which basically had already had kind of uh, destroyed the uh, civil infrastructure there. It was uh, all whatever was there was under pressure uh, because of the uh, huge population which lives in that small enclave, more than 2.3 uh, million people. 
over and above that the bombings have destroyed whatever was remaining there so even if uh, in the last four days there were some relief some aid pouring in some food some medicine uh, uh, fuel going in that is not that was not enough to kind of uh, even uh, restore the 10 to 20 percent of the whatever is required and that has resulted into now reports coming from different parts of gaza of uh, disease outbreak uh, and then there are still people uh, trapped inside uh, the uh, the ruins of the buildings which were dis- uh, basically bombed uh, by uh, by israel and uh, during these uh, four days around 150 uh, people uh, basically bodies were recovered fr- from inside those debris uh, and there are more people there are thousands of people missing uh, and and mo- most of them are feared to be trapped inside those uh, debris which were created due to the bombings on the residential uh, areas by Israel uh, for for over uh, almost close to one and a half month. So yeah, that was the overall condition. Yeah. Right, Abdul, of course, uh, we're talking about the extension of the truce, but what really is the need of the hour is the ce- is a ceasefire. And of course, like you said, that has been the call uh, from the streets around the world, including in the, in the global north as well. Uh, that has been the call from relief agencies. But statements from Israel do not seem to indicate that they're in any mood for anything more than a temporary truce at this point of time. And it doesn't even look like some of these the global North countries, their biggest backer, backers, are in any mood to also push for a ceasefire, despite the fact that close to 15,000 people have died. Exactly. Uh, if you see uh, Israeli Defense Minister, uh, other officials have repeatedly said that they don't want to extend this truce beyond certain few days, which basically will secure the release of the hostages, whatever hostages uh, Hamas has. And that is their immediate target. Uh, they want to release as many people as possible. And once it is done, they basically want to continue their offensive inside Gaza. So their obje- stated objective of kind of, quote unquote, destroying Hamas's infrastructure in Gaza, uh, basically they want to fulfill it. And uh, this is also, uh, if you see, follow the Israeli politics, domestic politics, there is a strong sentiment for that. But also because uh, the family of the hostages uh, taken uh, have also created some kind of pressure. So the Israeli government was in very uh, in a, in a situation where it had to look for some ways to uh, kind of make sure that maximum number of hostages are released. So, so this temporary truce and the extension which it got, uh, which, which it has got, and maybe it will be extended for two, 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 two three days more in future. Nobody knows. Uh, basically, it is with the objective to kind of uh, uh, release as many hostages as possible and. Uh, as if now there is a pressure, of course, on Israel from the global uh, uh, powers, from the US, from the European Union. If you see the statements made in the last few days by some of the European leaders saying that the, uh, there is a need of uh, permanent peace, uh, sorry, permanent ceasefire in, in Gaza, um, that pressure is there. But that, whether that pressure will work or not, whether that pressure will remain the way it is now, it also depends on on how Israel sees uh, uh, the overall situation in terms of um, uh, how, uh, hostages. One and the second thing, of course, uh, uh, Israeli army was, of course, uh, in a uh, was overstretched because it, the offensive went on for forty eight days, and it is not a, a easy fight for them. So they also wanted to recuperate their forces to some extent, and the, the truce is primarily seen as a strategic move to kind of provide some kind of break uh, to the uh, overstretched uh, Israeli uh, forces. Once they are re- uh, their energy is restored, it seems uh, Israel is willing to uh, continue the offensive. And uh, given the larger politics, as we have discussed already, uh, there is no reason that is, uh, Israel will, uh, the pressure will continue to be the, uh, be the same. Abdul, thank you so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you as uh, de- develop further developments take place. On the show, we are consistently reported on humanity's fight against TB, a disease which kills too many people even to this day. The global south bears the brunt of this disease and while there has been a return to pre-pandemic levels of reporting of cases, people still struggle to access medicines and care. It's in this context that the annual Union World Conference on Lung Health was held from November 14th to 18th. It brought together a diverse set of stakeholders to discuss issues around TB. 
But the conference also brought out some interesting contradictions in this battle. We go to Jyotsna Singh for more. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like I said, uh, this uh, TB is an issue we talk about very often on this show. Uh, it's various dimensions and the uh, effect it has on millions of lives. Uh, very unfortunate. And here we have another conference, of course. And I think many of these conferences are important because of, of course, some of the topics they're discussed, but also each of them presents its own, uh, you know, version of challenges, some of the questions that come up. So maybe could you take us through this conference itself? What is this conference? Why, was, uh, why are we talking about it today? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Happy to be back. Um, so the Union Conference is an annual conference which is organized uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, various funders. Um, it can be civil society organizations. Some are actually big pharma companies or diagnostic companies and they come together. Uh, uh, but also it provides a space to uh, the TB community, TB affected people, and they fought for this space. Uh, and um, that's why you can see them uh, sitting on the table at times with the government and therefore in the union conference also. Um, and it discusses a lot of things uh, which are relevant for TB for that particular year. Um, and um, so, so that's what we saw. We saw a lot of presence of uh, sessions related to science uh, this time because many new uh, scientific trials uh, regarding medicines etc happened uh, for example the end tb trial for uh, drug resistant tb and uh, how to shorten the time period to uh, for the medicines to be given to patients uh, so that they can recover faster and better um, so so there were those presentations that happened uh, there was also uh, a separate section of Community Connect where the TB survivors and the TB community itself, uh, they were present and they would hold their own uh, sessions and the issues and advocacy and communications um, and also talking about their daily lives. Uh, so, so these are the things that happened uh, this time. Uh, there was also a session and uh, interesting presentations on the link between nutrition and TB. And as many of us know that this year, a, a landmark study came out um, on TB, which was conducted in Jharkhand in India, which actually clearly showed that if you are able to provide uh, good nutrition to the patients and their families, then not only you have uh, better outcomes for the patients, but because family is also eating better, the transmission of TB and uh, is less, so less people because it's an infectious di disease. Lesser number of people get infected by uh, uh, the TB affected population. So, so, so there were these presentations, and uh, that's what it uh, was very interesting to see. Yeah, Jyotsna, but also I believe quite a few controversies which also say something about uh, how some of these conferences are organized. So maybe could you take us to that as well? Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, I mean, I have participated in a few of uh, the union conferences in the past. This year I wasn't there. Uh, but uh, the issues remain the same. And, and I think this is becoming very frustrating and challenging for the TB community and the activists uh, to uh, sort of deal with. Uh, because uh, you keep getting discriminated against again and again. Uh, so, for example, one major, major issue that emerged was denial of visas. So the conference was in uh, Paris, in France, and a lot of uh, TB survivors, they were not given the visa. And uh, actually the reason given in some cases was um, that what if they go to the country and never came, come back. And these are the people who had full funding. They had, uh, some of them had letter from the union conference also. Uh, so th there is, a, a, and this has happened in the past also, and there is a demand that the union conference management has to speak to the governments wherever they are organizing. And it is a rotationary thing. It uh, gets organized across the world in various countries. Uh, but it, uh, it they have to choose places which are far more accommodating for people, for diversity. And you cannot have such racist, uh, uh, you know, uh, the reasons uh, for people not being able to attend. In fact, the uh, main speaker for the plenary session, the keynote speaker who was a TB survivor, could not get the visa and reach Paris. Um, so, so these were the major problems. And uh, that is uh, the other thing which you see, and again, we have witnessed in the past, uh, is how the community, the very use of the space, the physical space, uh, and which is so discriminatory. So uh, where the community is given the booths, 
uh, to organize and put their own stuff and uh, do their advocacy. It is always towards the dead end of the uh, entire space and not where the people would be passing. So it's more like there is a space uh, as if it's a, they are a different people and not uh, within the science, within the experts, uh, a space uh, where people discuss like big things, right? Uh, science and all. Uh, so this kind of a discrimination is really problematic. Um, even the room where the activists and the survivors uh, gather to, uh, to talk, and that was absolutely really far uh, uh, this time as well. Uh, so these are some of the demands that the community is making that we got to be in integrated everywhere. We do not want tokenism. Uh, and uh, we are the ones who are the stakeholders. We are not a separate entity. Uh, so that so that is uh, something and it becomes controversial every year. Uh, and um, the union is not finding solutions. The other thing was, but it also provided a space uh, to the activists to protest against uh, some of the very high prices. There was a huge protest during the uh, 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 opening session, inaugural session. Uh, where the activists went on the stage and the major demand this year with regard to pricing was bringing down the price of the diagnostics for the drug resistant TB. So uh, CFIT, which has been, uh, it's a diagnostic company, which was also one of the funders, by the way, and uh, they had a session where also there was a protest uh, during the uh, union conference. Uh, but uh, they, uh, so their uh, diagnostic, the expert test, as it is called, it's very costly. And of course, they have the monopoly over it. Uh, and it, it see if it has been uh, is uh, has been taken over by Deneher, this other corporation. Uh, but uh, so they uh, uh, the price was ten dollars uh, per test uh, 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 till uh, a few months ago. They uh, but the experts they have uh, some researchers have calculated it should not be more than five dollars. Per test. So there has been demand uh, to reduce the price to half. So it's time for five. Uh, that uh, slogan has been there for many, many years. The, see if it brought the prices down for a little bit for uh, multi-drug resistant TB, but for extreme drug resistant TB, which is a much worse form of TB, they have still not brought the price down. So that was the demand that it has to come down to five because that uh, corresponds to the production cost and uh, the, uh, it also involves a reasonable profit for the company and there were a lot of protests and let's hope something happens because uh, there was one good news at least this year earlier uh, this time when uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson the company right. makes bitaculin and uh, they ha are not enforcing their secondary patents uh, uh, at, in countries in the world. And that has happened because there has been pressure constantly on Johnson & Johnson uh, on their pricing of the medicine and monopoly over the medicine. So we hope that would happen in the space of diagnostics also. Um, so hopefully these protests that have happened will yield some results in near future. Right, Joe, thank you so much for that analysis. An issue we'll keep definitely coming back to because of its impact, like I said, on millions of lives. Thank you so much. And that's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. In the meanwhile, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.